Huzzah! Welcome, everyone, to Exploring Glorotha. This is our, man, 21st episode. It's almost hard to believe that we are, I mean, we're well over, I think. We're about to start our second year of Exploring Glorotha. Third year? Third year. We're about to end our second year, start our third year. This is why I employ Evan. He is, uh, <laughs> he is the Lake or my scholar to my Isseries initiate. So... On Exploring Glorampa, Evan and I talk about the wonderful mythological world of uh, Glorampa and how to break it up into digestible sized pieces for GMs and players to enjoy uh, and get started. Because one of the things is it can kind of be intimidating, right? You know, if somebody says, well, where do I learn about Glorampa? You've got a variety of different tearing up supplements the Glorantha source book is great. The guide to Glorantha is massive. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to break it up and show off what is cool about this world for gaming. Evan, how are you doing this morning? Hey, I'm doing great. Excellent. Glad to be here. I'm glad to have you here as well. So today, oh, and hello to John Doom in the chat. Good to have you along for this journey. Today we are talking about the Plains of Prax. If you are a member of the Iconic Patronage, you get all of Evan's notes, which is basically a syllabus for a master's course in all of these regions we are talking about. I learned so much as I'm going through, going, okay, here's the things we're going to try and highlight. So, we actually are breaking this up into two episodes, but not really. We're talking about Prax today, and then next month we're going to talk about Havis and Big Rubble, which is so integral to the Praxian experience, yet so different from the planes that we're having to kind of separate them. Put a little shoehorn separation there just for the purposes of our notes. But as Evan will point out as we're going through there, if you like what we do and you are starting to fall in love with Glorantha, go over to the God Learners podcast. If we are your intro to Glor your 101 intro to Glorantha, they are definitely the rest of your courses on what makes this setting so alive so rich as my friend ben put it so weird yet strangely the people behind it get why gaming is awesome and i appreciate that about Ben. so evan let's talk about prax uh, can we talk about one other thing first uh, please <laughs> hey folks that's right as we record we are counting down to the tickets going live for Chaosium Con 2. Uh, this is not an advertisement. This is a just Exploring Glorantha went there last year for Chaosium Con 1. We had a great time. We met fans. We, it was an um, unbelievable experience because people actually came up to us and said, hey, I recognize you, which was surreal and wonderful. Weird. Um, <laughs> and uh, Exploring Glorantha is planning to go to Chaosium Con 2 as we record, of course, the tickets are about to go on sale on Sunday, August 21st. By the time you're seeing this on YouTube, the tickets are out and on sale. Uh, we had a great experience. Mm -hmm. We'd highly recommend it. It was a lot of fun. It was very intimate. Obviously, they're, you know, they've, it's in the hundreds of people that are going, not thousands or tens of thousands. Having just come and... back from Gen Con, I'm looking <laughs> forward to Chaosium Con. <laughs> and... You get to meet all the great people that uh, make Chaosium work, that, uh, uh, that create a ton of Glorantha and other content. Obviously, Seventh Sea, Call of Cthulhu, Pendragon, um, and, uh, and lots of oldies but goodies, Ringworld, Stormbringer, uh, all of those things are there. So um, anyway, just a plug there because we had fun. I, I just opened my copy of Stormbringer that I bought at the Chaosium auction last year and I'm reading through it and man I really hope we get a new edition of Stormbringer that would just <laughs> like I want this I want the RuneQuest Glorantha Call of Cthulhu treatment for just an eternal champion game and then I would you know just I would say I'd die happy but that's not true I will die happy I'm just planning on gaming in the Young Kingdoms <laughs> my goal for for a really long time before dying please okay well, you know <laughs> we'll have that discussion later all right all right okay so, well so we're gonna talk about on prax. to prax 
So if you're looking at a map of Dragon Pass, we're kind of following the movement rune as we spiral out around Sartar. So we went Sartar, Tarsh. Now to the east of Sartar and Tarsh are the Plains of Prax. There's a ton of great information on Prax. You can hit the guide. You can hit the Gloranthan source book. You can go to the wall of uh, the well of Dahlia. Cults of Prax, Borderlands as a RuneQuest classic, Pavis, Threshold to Danger, Big Rubble, the Deadly City, these are all RuneQuest classic supplements, Pavis, Gateway to Adventure, which was for Quest Worlds, which is actually my first experience with Prax. And then Evan gave a ton of other uh, uh, things that are available. Sun County, Nomad Gods, uh, Dragon Pass in the board game. RuneQuest Gloranthan Bestiary, RuneQuest Roleplaying Gloranthan, because you can actually play as a Praxian in the current edition of RuneQuest. In fact, one of the big characters in my multi-year RuneQuest game was actually a Bolo Lizard Praxian. I mean, we, I think we had at least we had two Bison Riders. They died. Very quickly. Um, rest in peace. We had... Man, I think we had three Bison Riders and two Bolo Lizard Riders. Like, there was a lot of Praxian. So, Prax is sort of a... There, there's a dichotomy there. Because you have Prax, which is very barbarian focused if you will right all of the different tribes they're writing different types of animals you've got the moro camp they kind of migrate throughout prax they all have their tribal grounds and then yet you have this anchor point that of pavis and big rubble which we'll talk about next month this giant city or giant city depending on how you want to look at it and prax is caught between Sartar and Tarsh in the west, and this civilized point of Pavist in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the east. Now, if you play God's War, oh, I love God's War. Uh, this was once the Garden of the World. This was once the most beautiful place. And during the God time, Stormbull fought Wackboth the Devil here. And is it three times he was thrown down and almost killed, and his wife basically who is the earth goddess of this area, drew in her energy and gave it to Stormbull. And every time she did that, Prax became, went from a garden down to sort of the, the steppe tundra um, plains that we have today. Until finally, I, right, correct me if I'm wrong, Evan, I'm, I'm, I'm waxing eloquently, right? Isseries. The truth is as, less as important as the telling of the tale. Um... It basically Stormbull doesn't win. Stormbill holds off Whackboth the Devil long enough for this giant block of true stone, one of these pieces of the spike, which has apparently been tumbling through the middle air for an unknown amount of time, finally hits the devil and skids him across the plains of cracks to where uh, the block now rests. And we're gonna talk about that. Uh, any corrections from my link or my associate? Well, yeah. Um, the the thing is that the, the the land is blighted in the first instance when the devil kills Gennert, right? The 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 Earth God of the Northern Continent, right. Gennertella. Right, and then you have Pomatella, um, right. being yeah, yes, Pomalt still being the living uh, Earth Earth male earth force of the uh, of the southern continent but the northern continent has lost that because the gaul um and the the legions of chaos destroy Gennert and and all his peoples um and completely blast the mm -hmm. center you know what was the the center of of life fertility energy for the continent that was where prax was it was his garden that and the wastes um and now it's this post-apocalyptic uh, wasteland um, of which Prax, which is an exceptionally forbidding area, is the best place. That's right. Um, it gets worse the further <laughs> east you go. That's right. Um, and uh, and so yes, 
the the last stand against the devil is led by Stormbull here aided by his wife Aretha who is a daughter of Arnalda um mm -hmm. and uh and uh the the land does support uh, Stormbull and the the real tearing of uh, energy from the land to keep Stormball fighting uh, comes from a place now called the Dead Place, where, I mean, basically all the life was ripped out of it in order to, you know, hold the devil off again long enough for the block to fall on uh, on the devil and 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 crush him. Um, so this is the this is the landscape that we're dealing with in prax a, a high chaparral mm -hmm. of uh, uh, of uh, that's uh, exceptionally challenging you know think about any number of you know very arid uh landscapes the southwest of the united states for example mm -hmm. northern mexico um maybe some parts of the Gobi Desert or that's, or, that's or kind of where my brain other, goes other the, areas yeah the, the steppes of southern Russia right yeah right so very arid um, uh, and uh, being highly mobile and being able to move from resource to resource is becomes critical right and that's why we have a tremendous uh, uh, and complex set of nomadic cultures living and moving and 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 struggling against one another on the plane of cracks. And we'll get to those in a second because I really want to talk about uh, you have sort of the human Praxian tribes. You have one tribe that is now thrown in with the Lunars and kind of lording it over everyone else. Then you have the Moracanth and you can't talk about Prax without talking about the Moracanth and the Herdmen which if any of my old players are watching I just sent chills down their spine. But the the boundaries of prax and as as evan said it gets work prax is like your your best case post-apocalyptic and i love that was it mob wrote mad prax uh because there's a connection there it, ben if you ever watch this know that you're probably going to want to be from the praxian wastelands further so it's bounded by sartar and tarsh in the west and then by the river Zola fell in the east and it's Zola fell is sort of the best place to live in Prax and then east of that is vulture country it's it's even worse and we'll talk more about Zola fell when we get into the story of Pavis because it factors strongly into the story of Pavis factors strongly into the story of uh, Argrath and the hero wars if you have read the Prince of Sartar webcomic, you get to see one of the iconic moments of Argrath's life as he's defending a giant cradle as it floats down the river towards the sea. So, um, let's talk. Man, all right, Evan, there's so much good stuff in here. Again, I highly recommend if you love Loranta, you just need to su subscribe to the Patreon so you get the notes from this show. All right, let's talk about, Evan and I kind of did a high level view of what mythologically happened here, right? There's there's a mythological reason for why this is such a devastated area. And in fact, there's a very cool, I don't want to call it meteorological phenomenon, but there is a very cool mythological phenomenon that blows back and forth, moves throughout uh Prax and Evan, I'd love for you to talk to us about the eternal battle. Yeah. Well, so Prax, you know, there was so much conflict in Prax that that pieces of uh, the uh, the time before time, the the god time, the gods war, uh, blip in and out around Prax and the wastelands. Mm -hmm. So the eternal battle is a piece of the the struggle between Stormbull and the devil um and of course you know it's not just those two divine beings struggling cosmic beings but also all of their followers there were armies battling across prax so you can be traveling across prax and suddenly the skies will go dark the winds will whip up 
uh, you know, horrible, noxious, uh, poisonous vapors flying around. And suddenly, you know, out of a funnel cloud from the sky will appear all sorts of, of, uh, of uh, eternally battling creatures. Um, at this point, uh, basically, you know, skeletons, zombies, undead. Um, uh, and they are locked in the eternal conflict of fighting one another and anything else that happens to be around, like you. Um, and if you're really, really lucky, maybe one of the, you know, low level, but extremely frightening um, uh, uh, officers, you know, leaders of the, uh, of the chaotic side, um, uh, the, uh, the example that uh, appears in Borderlands and also in the, uh, the Hero Quest slash Quest World supplement is, a, uh, is an avatar of Ragnar, the, uh, the, the <laughs> one of the unholy trio and father of the brews um, shows up also to, you know, spoil your day. Um, so this is for just about everybody, you know, a, an experience you just have to survive. Hopefully, you know, maybe try to run away from if you follow Storm Bowl, on the one hand, um, this is actually, uh, this is a religious experience. Right. This is getting to step into and uh, and fight along with in the in the spirit with your God. Your your special rune is the eternal battle rune, and and this is you know this is a special blessing for you. You get to jump in, and the the battlers that are the 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 echoes or the survivors or the the emanations of uh, Stormbull's side um, uh, won't attack you. They might attack all your friends, but they right. won't attack you. And you can just concentrate on fighting the monster skeletons and the big avatar of chaos. And and it is a great day for you as a Stormbull. It, um, it because has whether links. you live or die, it's, yeah. So yeah. It reminds me a lot of the Wild Hunt. When we mm, look at the yes. Wild Hunt in sort of um, you know, the United Kingdoms um, in yeah. sort of that, that force that just comes out of nowhere and you either yeah. hide or you survive. And then they added a little bit of Glorant into it. And like, they're not directly parallel. It's just, now I will say... Because I, I think the Wild Hunt is also running around Glorant. <laughs> it is, it is. Uh, <laughs> this is just the special Prax flavored one. This is just the worst one. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just finished uh, the book of Hjortling mythology and good lord the, the myths about Ragnalar are rough to read just rough to read uh, so seeing as we're going to be talking about the animal peoples would this be eternal battles with the spotless kind no <laughs> okay so there's a lot of fun places as a GM and as a player that you may want to visit in Prax. We've been talking about how awful it is, and believe me, it's it's worse than you, you think. But there are reasons that people live in areas like this. There are hidden oases that, or they're called the hidden greens, where the tribes will gather, they will, they're on the circuits, there are places of beauty in the midst of the plains. We've got the Monkey Ruins, which is the, we don't have, I wish we had, like, we could do an entire episode on any one of these places. The Monkey Ruins, which is the ancient ruins of the City of the Monkey, which was destroyed when Oak fed one of the fire deities, correct? Fell to Earth. Yes. Um, Moon Broth is the big oasis that uh, nearly killed my players, where the Lunars... Uh, <laughs> uh, are kind of at and then uh, let's why don't you talk about the paps and pimpers block sure okay well the paps is the um the heart of the surviving earth powers uh in prax you know prax is this uh largely infertile but but still tenuously holding on uh, uh land um and uh in these in the hills in this big oasis is an ancient earth temple uh, a vast complex 
uh, to all of the powers of Earth. It is in the uh, care of the Aretha uh, priestesshood. Um, it is neutral ground for all of the tribes of Prax. Um, you know, they need their connection to the goddess of their animals um, and uh, the, the uh, other powers of earth and fertility, which can sustain them in this harsh land. So, um, you know, members of all tribes uh, send uh, women generally to be, uh, uh, to serve in this temple and to ensure the connection uh, with the earth um, and uh, the, the, for the continued uh, access to, to what little bounty there is for survival. Um, this is the place where uh, the, the, um, the ancestresses of the various tribes and the tribal animals um, uh, are uh, kept and protected. And there are um, statues to animals that nobody even knows what they are right. anymore because some of them didn't didn't make it but they are still you know there's still an echo of their memory here at this great temple um sort of kind of like that, the antediluvian concept of what yeah. was what was there yeah yeah absolutely again and and prax is very much you know there are layers and layers of things in prax because you know, again, once it was the center of civilization, mm -hmm. of fertility, of, uh, of of power, it was Eden, and right. then it was blasted and destroyed. But but there are echoes and layers still there. So the Paps is one of those connections back to the Edenic past, um, and a, a, a memorial of the many sacrifices that were made for survival. Um, Thanks, John, for and, the uh, yeah. for the pre-flood for those uh, for those uh, ant. I, I love the ancient Near East, so antediluvian is is a word that is just kind of uh, <laughs> swirling around in my in my head. Um, so, in contrast to this, uh, you know, great place of you know in a, in a in a land of war, a place of peace, uh, a pe a place. Uh, where there's reconciliation, where there's connection to the powers of life and harmony and fertility. Um, Pepper's Block is an oasis uh, on, the, on the edge of uh, Prax and Dragon Pass. Now, Dragon pa you know, Prax is outside of Dragon mm -hmm. Pass, but it has a deep relationship to it, and that's why we're talking about it. Um, and Pepper's Block is the traditional place where... Um, Slaves are sold. Mm -hmm. uh, slavery is uh, is integral to the conflicts mm -hmm. uh, between the Praxians, between Praxians and outsiders. And so Pepper's Block is where people go to ransom their, uh, uh, to, to, to redeem and ransom uh, their uh, tribes members clan members, family members who may have been taken in war, um, and where, you know, the, the civilized and, and barbaric come to um, purchase labor, mm -hmm. purchase access, uh, people who may have skills and knowledge that, uh, that they don't have, or maybe simply for labor. Again, we are in a Bronze Age uh, uh, civilization, and one uh, particularly here on the edge of Prax, uh, where uh, the there are harsh realities of, of life and uh, civilization. Now, if I, and, if I uh, interrupt you real quick, oh, Evan, there's, there's two sure. things to keep in mind here. One, the RuneQuest Arms and Equipment Guide goes through an amazing, has an amazing kind of ex expansion on this. But remember, slavery in the Bronze Age worked completely different than slavery post-Enlightenment. Slavery in the Bronze Age was a way to pay off debts. It was what you did with prisoners of war as opposed to just murdering them. Uh, it was what happened in tribal raids. You would you would capture slaves. Slavery worked completely differently. And if you are more interested in this topic, check out the new uh, equipment guide from for RuneQuest. And they have a giant sidebar on this. 
The other thing that's funny that I had to explain to my players is because they were really uh, ruffled by the fact that this was called Pimper's Block. It's named after actually one of the people who played in the original Prax game, whose last name was Pimper. The coincidence between <laughs> the fact that the the slave town is also called Pimper's Block, well, that is just a... Uh, the thing about coincidences is they just sometimes happen. Please continue. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, so um, for about a decade, the, the Lunars dominate um, Prax, and uh, and so uh, it, very close in time to the new the current start of uh, uh, the, uh, the the supported campaign um, in Glorantha uh, that has you know just recently changed you know the, the lunars are are uh, on their back heels and uh, they no longer control things and probably the question of who exactly controls Pimper's Black between uh you know uh yeah, independent entrepreneurs uh different clans or tribes in in sartar uh, uh nomadic tribes in um uh in prax uh is probably up for grabs now we mm -hmm. might get some information uh as they uh as they expand the uh official uh uh, products into Prax and, and we get the Sartar uh, campaign. Uh, but, um, but that is a prime area for, uh, for conflict. And, um, and, you know, there are, there are definitely um, uh, strains of thought, you know, that are, that uh, uh, are anti-slavery um, in the various cultures, even as they um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. interact with it on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So, yeah. you know, I think there'd be a perfectly, you know, your Glorantha would be very well to very, you know, where maybe, you know, somebody wants to occupy that and say, hey, we need to have, you know, there's always another way. Yeah. And maybe we need to not have a huge slave market right here on the interface between Sartre and Prax. My group burned it to the ground. Um, hey, Mark, good to see you. All right, so let's talk about so that's some of the highlights of places in Prax that you can you can visit. Now let's talk about the peoples of Prax because I think this is for so that's really more GM side. Like here's why you would want to go there. Let's look at the dead place. Let's go fight at Pippers Block. Go visit the Paps. For players, you're gonna to want to know the what block. You, the block. Oh, the block. Right. So the block is still there. The block that squished and trapped the devil underneath it is still there, and you have water flowing in to kind of wash it away but where the water where the runoff goes you have this like horrible swamp filled with chaos and evil obviously stop number one on your whirlwind tour of, of prax but prax is populated by animal peoples and what do we mean by that so the animal nomads they're nomadic tribes they're more of a neolithic civilization in the fact that you know they they like metal, but they don't have a way to produce it, right? So they're, they're bringing in sort of the new stone, right? Am I, remember, am I remembering my Latin correct? Neolithic, yes. new stone. Uh, but, so there's this story, there's this myth, right? Because everything in Glorantha comes back to the myths. So during, and Evan will, will dial me in here. Uh, at, at some point during the God time, is it God time or just after when they... Well have to make so, the choices it's in the period after uh after Stormbull defeats the devil right but, but has to retreat to find healing right then his son with aretha waha has to uh, make the tough decision you know he's left Stormbull mm -hmm. is not is a leader yeah Stormbull, Stormbull, uh is is the the fighter that you need when the devil shows up but then when you need to have harsh and difficult decisions made for survival that's his son waha and so he then leads the people uh frees the the um animals the herds. Uh, that had been the 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 herd uh uh protectoresses um uh from their captivity but the world has been destroyed 
Mm -hmm. um, and so in order to survive, harsh choices have to be made. And these harsh choices come down to who will eat and who will be eaten, essentially. Those that are eaten become herd creatures. They eat grass. There's a, some sort of change that happens to them. And those that eat the herd beasts become, right, the rulers. And there are five main tribes and a number of other, like, super interesting little tribes. But before we get into that, or after we get into that, we need to talk about horses. Because the one thing you won't find in cracks are horses. You'll find zebras. You'll find unicorns. You won't find horses. We'll talk about that. So four of the five major tribes win the hard choice are humans. And so humans are the dominant species in those tribes. They, and they'll eat anyone else's herd animals, but you better not touch our herd animals. And that seeing as like everyone sort of adheres to that, you can see how a complex network of uh, cattle raiding and cattle defense becomes a thing. In fact, the brilliant card game by Chaosium, Con of Cons, is all about cattle raiding. So, one tribe, however, that's not how it goes. And we get the Moracanth and the Herdmen, which caused existential dread in my players. And you just need to explain this to your players, and it will cause existential dread in them. Evan, Please talk to us about the Moracanth and the Herdmen, and then we'll come back to horses and Waha and the and the main deed. Waha it takes the same place as Orlanth, if you will, among the the Praxian tribes. So, um, so the Moracanth were uh, they are a tapir. They're an intelligent tapir-like uh, species. Um, they were uh, they. In the before time, there were animals that had relationships with human beings, and the 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 animals and the human beings were all one people essentially. This is a little different than the animal people that survived, like the Telmori, who are the wolf people. This seems to be a different relationship on the on the plains of Prax. But these animal peoples, um, this decision of that now the creatures that are going to become animals are going to be able to eat the things that grow in prax. And then for the, the people to survive, they're going to eat the animals. So lots are drawn and, you know, lo and behold, the human beings get to be the people in for the five great tribes of Trax, four out of the five times. Mm -hmm. And the, what would we would might think of as the animals, the tapir like Moracanth, who are essentially still vegetarians, uh, uh, get uh, their animals, herd animals, are these were people in the god time. And they become uh, uh, animalistic in that they, they don't have culture, they don't have intelligence, uh, at the level of uh, of regular human beings. So let me ask you and a question. They must be eaten. Let yeah. me ask you a question, Evan. What would happen, yes. say, if you had a a player character who was captured by the Moracanth and put out to herd with the herd people? Well, so um, first we have to understand how the herdmen, herd people, operate for the Moracanth. Um, they, uh, the Moracanth have to ritually, in order to maintain the pact, they do have to ritually eat one of their uh, herd um, uh, or a captured member, uh, you know, other animal. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they don't do that actually by preference. But people are terrified that they do. They are man eaters. Right. Because they have because heard people. They have heard men. They have heard people. But what the herdmen do is that they are actually trained to forage for the things that the Moracanth can mm -hmm. eat on the plains. So they are intelligent, you know, this sort of think of them like sort of the lower end of the human beings in the first Planet of the Apes movie. 
they can't speak. They, so um, that's, a, that's not a perfect analogy. So, but the rumors about the Morcant and what the Morcant will do to human beings are, are wild. Mm -hmm. They're terrified. They're man eaters. They will take your intelligence. Uh, they will, you know, the, the you know, the, you, you can't let human slaves go to Morakanth because the, they will just treat them like, um, uh, like, uh, you know, human cattle. It's much more complex than that. They actually do have human slaves to do things that you would have, anybody else would have human slaves. I need you to write. They don't have opposable thumbs, Morakanth. Yeah. Uh, a, a special magic item is actually a magical thumb that a Morakanth can put on to have opposable digits. Um, they, they can do, you know, sort of gross manipulation. They can use spears and things like that, but they don't have fine manipulation. They have to either train very specialized members of their herd or have human slaves to, to do things like to, uh, to, to do any of the complex things that you would need digits mm -hmm. to do. Um, so if somebody were captured and, you know, you're going to be put out to herd, you think, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm going to be next on the chopping block. But, but the Morcanth are rational uh, actors as well. They're going to take someone and it's like, okay, you have intelligence, you know, you, we're going to put you out to oversee and to spare us work. You're going to have to work with the, the herd people and uh, make sure that they're, um, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing, going, making sure that they're protected from predators, etc. cetera. Um, of course, all the time, you know, the, the human being is going to be trying to figure out how to get out of here because the Morcanth can punish you. They could ritually take your intelligence away and, and make you into a herd person. I, uh, um, I'm enjoying Becca's reaction because all of the information that Becca had, Becca's characters had for the Morricans came from other Orlanthi, which means all of the rumors oh, yeah. were true. And Becca is struggling with a different, a different point of view when we do it in Exploring right. Loratha when, the, when I am telling it to you as a GM. Right. So the other thing is, of course, you know, as a human being being kept by the Morricans, um, they know that you eat meat and, you know, they have to eat meat in order to keep the pack, but they prefer not to, it's not really their diet. Um, but they would want to keep you healthy and they would feed you the meat that they have. Um, which comes from their herds. That's right. Uh, so, <laughs> so the five main tribes are the Morakanth, which we just <laughs> talked about. Uh, the Sable Riders, who ride on giant antelopes. The High Llama Riders, which are the smallest tribe, but uh, I love the High Llama Riders. They just, they look fantastic. The Impala, excuse me, the Impala people, the Bison Riders. Uh, one of the minor tribes that I love is the Bolo Lizard Riders. But you'll notice that each of these is named after their herd animal. And so there, there's this symbiotic relationship between the people and the herd animal, as Evan just explained with the the Morakanth. And what you'll see as you kind of go through this, there's all these different uh, smaller tribes that are super interesting. But as a player, even in core RuneQuest Glorantha, you can play as a large number of these Praxian nomad. And how they interact with Sartar is kind of defined through the cultural roles. But again, you won't see any horses. Evan, why are there no horses? Well, uh, there's too it, much. Let me sum a, up. It, 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 there's a deep mystery there. But I mean, the uh, horses are um, the Praxians define themselves as the enemy of horse riders, and they feel that the horse is a taboo animal. Prax is a holy place for them. Mm -hmm. It may be a blasted wasteland of high chaparral and difficult, you know, of, of torturous weather and, and, uh, and, 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 and many dangers, hidden places of chaos, etc. But it is still the holy place for their, them mm -hmm. and their religion. It is where they learned to survive. 
and the horse they believe pollutes that land. Where did that come from? It came from the God time. It came from their myths. Um, so they, uh, you know, it, it, absent certain, you know, uh, uh, special conditions, you should not be caught riding a horse on the plains of Prax. Now, uh, we say that there are no horse riders, but at various times, of course, horse riders uh, have invaded and been successful. Um, they have out nomaded the nomads on the plains of Prax. Um, one of the places that the wastes borders is Pent. Pent, mm -hmm. think of Pent as the great step like in Eurasia, mm -hmm. where you get the Huns, the Scythians, the Mongols, uh, uh, the Sarmatians, um, and um, uh, the Turks. And so, uh, and, and it is inhabited by, by people who call themselves the pure horse people. Mm -hmm. uh, they worship the horse. And uh, in the past, the pure horse people have come to Prax and they have carved out uh, a, a place for themselves, um, and then later been been driven from the plains of Prax. Some of the ancestors of the Grayslanders may have been pure horse people who, at one time, uh, uh, managed to um, uh, fight their way onto the the, the uh, plains of Prax. And there is a tribe known as the Bastard Tribe called the mm -hmm. Puljoni, mm -hmm. who we talked about a little bit in our Sartar episode. Yep. They are. They have their origin in Tarsh and Sartar. Um, they are allies now to uh, to Sartar, but they also fought their way onto the plains of Prax. Basically, you know, horses are forbidden unless you're from a group that can fight toe to toe with a, a bunch of uh, Praxian nomads and beat them uh, and drive them off, and and then make peace to a certain degree at least at the Paps be respectful and then they will they will still you know they will still fight you they will still raid you they will still plan about your ultimate demise but they will bide their time and accept you to a certain extent so they're the bastard tribe the pole joni they are horse riding cattle herders they don't fit the praxian mold they but but if you're riding with pole joni then you know mm -hmm. you're not automatically going to be you know, it won't be necessary in order to satisfy the taboos of Prax to annihilate you right away. But don't think that they are not thinking bad things about you because they are. Right. And we have two horse-like tribes when we look at the, the zebras, yes. which are really tied to Pavis, and yes. uh, the unicorn riders, which uh, my co-host of Exploring Glorantha, or of uh, the Grand Campaign, uh, Richard, was very disappointed that I did not tell him that was an option when we were playing uh, Hero <laughs> Quest. He was very I mean, or that there's a unicorn emperor, and I'm like, but it's but the unicorn emperor is a brew. He's like, but shh, you didn't tell me that there was a unicorn emperor. So let's talk about the main gods of Prax. We've kind of touched on Waha a bit. So Waha is sort of the chief, the son of Stormbull and Aretha. He uh, is, as Evan said, the one who frees the herd beasts. He establishes the peaceful cut, which is the way to end a herd creature's life in a way that immediately sends their soul back into the world for reincarnation. So it's sort of the idea that if you give an animal the peaceful cut, they will both sort of offer themselves up to the sacrifice, but also the tribe doesn't lose something by sacrificing that animal and and the cycle that keeps prax from falling over the edge continues uh i've actually never had anyone play a waha cultist in in a game yeah well i mean unless you're centered on prax um it's just a a a less i guess appealing um you know waha is the nephew of Orlin. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Praxian Pantheon is sort of a strange extension of the Orlanth Pantheon, but it's so specialized to the survivability um, uh, in Prax. Um, uh, 
uh, it, you know, you say you're from an Orlanth, you know, in Sartar, it's like, well, yes, everybody in that, that is sort of the socially accepted thing. Like, oh, you're a guy and you worship Orlanth. Good. You're one of us. Mm -hmm. In, in, on the plains of Prax, Orlanth is far less important day to day. He's still a very powerful, great God. There are worshipers there, but what is expected is that you will follow the ways of Waha because mm -hmm. he knows how to survive and he knows how to lead. Right. In the context of Prax and the Wastes. Um, so, uh, and he knows the secret magics that happen, you know, that are special to each tribe has a founder. And the, you know, the high priest of the particular uh, uh, tribe for Waha knows how to summon the founder, the great spirit that will protect and fight for that tribe. Um, so these are are, are very uh, important things. And the, the other thing about, of course, the Praxian pantheon is that they are much more spirit oriented. Yes, they generate many that. more shamans um, than than pure sort of rune priests, rune lords. Um, they uh, they live in a world uh, of, of spirits and uh, the spirits of the past, the spirits of the dead. Uh, the spirits of the the landscape, uh, chaos and disease and danger, and you need a, a shaman to mediate that to protect your people and to stay connected to your ancestors, which is deeply important for the Praxians. Right, and I was gonna. Nope, got nothing to add there. That was that was perfect. So <laughs> there's the other big if you have Waha sort of as the masculine role in praxing culture then you have the herd mother as the kind of feminine role stepping in for ernalda in the west we've talked a lot about storm bowl at many points along the way when we covered the storm pantheon when we've talked about orlance history so let's focus on our uh, aretha evan so we've established that uh she's the wife of storm bowl that she was the source of the life of the earth in Prax, and that three, you know, three times she ended up draining her own life to keep Stormbull fi fighting in the Battle of I Fought We Won. Now she is buried under the earth at this point, and we've lost her, right? Like her location where she is sending out, you know, her sacred cave, if you will, her sacred womb has been lost to the Praxian nobles. So why don't you talk a little bit about her, and then we'll get into the the i will say the meat but it's really not we've you know we're we're we're, we're getting the gristle if you will why you need to go to prax right well so aretha yes so she's the 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 herd mother she's waha's mother um and uh again the source of bounty like uh like ernalda or esrola but in this particular praxian context and her communication is indirect through the particular um, uh, animal goddess um, of the particular herd for the particular tribe. So there is a, a, um, a bison ancestress, an Obolo lizard ancestress. Uh, and, and so uh, they mediate with her. She is, as you say, removed during the, during the, end stage of the uh the the war against chaos she was buried and um her bounty still issues onto the plane that animals uh, are are still uh you know regenerated and uh but um you have to contact her through uh the medium of her uh her daughters the mm -hmm. um the uh herd uh, protectresses and um so and she is worshipped off of the she is understood also off of the plains of prax um uh because uh more generally you know she is uh, the mother of herd animals so mm -hmm. in sartar she is seen as the the mother of their cattle of uh, uh of other herds um uh, as well again mediated through um a uh a mask or a a descendant um so she's very um, 
uh, very important even beyond uh, Prax, but but she's so specialized. Uh, um, and so she's the the peacemaker, you know, the 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 holder of the paps. Um, you know, the paps has a communication, you know, through to as close to being able to communicate directly to her as, as possible. Um, uh, and so she can mediate peace between the tribes. She's the healer, the source mm -hmm. of fertility, the source of feminine wisdom, um, and, uh, you know, very critical. She's not a strong, you know, adventuring necessarily uh, 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 cult. patron, yeah. cult. Uh, but on the other hand, just as we've seen that uh, Ernalda can be, although her role is not typically to, to adventure, um, uh, she can be a powerful patron. And the respect, particularly the social role of Aretha, um, is so critical that um, she could you know, you could create a very interesting uh, 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 character mm -hmm. to, to play through, um, even though, you know, her, her job is not to handle weapons and not to um, not to generate offensive magic necessarily, um, uh, you know, but, um, you know, that's Waha's job. Right. So... As GMs and players, let's. I'm going to switch two parts of the outline. So we're going to, we'll start with the why go to Prax, and then we'll go into yeah. what support there is. So for me, right, I'm speaking to my GMs here. For me, Prax is awesome because it takes us from kind of a, a, a more Bronze Age setting into a more sword and sorcery style setting. This is very much... A uh, little bit, you know, your, your Neolithic era, you've got... Uh, wars that are constantly just simmering in the background. Yes, you have the civilization off uh, to the east and the west, to Pavis, to Pimper's Block, and Sartar and beyond, but that's really not what you guys are, you're setting your game strictly in kind of the, the heart of the barbaric in Glorantha. And what's funny is it's sort of, right, the Lunars look down on the Tarshites for being a little bit more bar barbarous, they both look down on Sartar for being even more barbarous, and yet the Sartarites look down on the Praxians for being... There's always someone else to be the barbarians at your gates, if you will. So this helps focus and hone in a game, right? Some of the main themes of Prax are going to be, uh, as we've talked about even with Sartar games, they're going to be cattle raids, survival. If you like post-apocalyptic kind of settings you have most of the tropes of post-apocalypse right here in prax you got to defend your territory it's your community versus others what resources do you have do we have enough resources to go claim this other resource or will it take out both of us in the attempt you have trade caravans lost in secret empires treasure hunts when we get into pavis next month pavis is sort of where you can have the quintessential, if you will, fantasy 20 dungeon crawl. Yet there are still places here. We had somebody on the Patreon or on the Patreon Discord server today ask about doing dungeon crawls in in Glorantha. There is a lot to look at in Prax. If you want to mess with your players and send them into the dead place, cool, now your magic doesn't work. How do you survive then? Is there a way to restore the garden, right? That's a big theme among the Praxians. Whereas Sartrites look back at the god time and things have more or less existed the same for them. Prax really sees the god time even more so as this, as Evan said, this Edenic period. Why should that not come back? What would it take to bring that back? And then, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Evan to say for GMs why he thinks people should should play here. But I'm stealing a lot of a lot of uh, his thunder. I apologize. Uh, if you want to play in the Hero Wars, Argrath's rise happens here in Prax before it happens in Sartar, right? 
Argraf starts in Pavis. He gathers his forces. He gathers the tribes. And really the Praxians become sort of the backbone of his move into the West. You have all of this grand sweeping barbarism versus civilization. All of this coming together that eventually leads into a leader rising and traveling out of the East into the West at the head of an army of people that were considered barbarians. Just look at Rome, look at Europe. This is a cycle that constantly, just constantly repeats itself. Evan, for you, what is, why would you set a game for new GMs in, in Prax? Yeah. Well, so uh, uh, first I'm going to say, you know, let's, let's look at in a completely different context for inspiration Think of the Fremen in, in from Dune. Ooh, it's a good one. You know, they are Praxians. They just don't have uh, beasts to ride. I mean, they got but, sandworms. Um, it's the sandworm they tribe. Have sandworms. That's right. That's right. Um, so, um, you know, they are, because of the harsh land that they live in, um, they are these, you know, premier gorilla guerrilla fighters um they are uh you know absolutely terrifying in terms of their their ability to to raid and attack and fight um you know they have uh they've had some setbacks you know the lunars beat them um in and um but uh but they've been beaten before and they always come back you know they're mm -hmm. great hero is one who is constantly reincarnating. Goldtooth, I love him. We're gonna talk a lot about him in. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Jaldin. Uh, so, um, so you know, when the tribes unite, uh, they are pretty unstoppable. Um, so, uh, so if you want to uh, explore sort of the um, the uh, you know how dangerous sort of badass these guys are off in the wastelands off in uh imprax uh leading this harsh life um and uh, the sort of reaction of all of the the quote unquote more civilized areas around them it, it's uh it's a it's very interesting and the fremen also have this you know in dune this plan to go back to Eden, mm -hmm. to restore Arrakis. And somewhere deep in the in the psyche of the Praxians is also this wish to return to um to even though they they disdain those who live in easier places, they want to restore um their own land. You know, this this was their promised land. It's the holy country, um, and it was, yeah. it is right, and it was blasted by the forces of evil, by chaos, um, by betrayal and war, um, and if they could bring it back, uh, uh, they would, and it would be a titanic struggle. But then, you know, an amazing, um, uh, uh, amazing victory, and yet also, like with the Fremen, if you've struggled through the Dune books. Uh, in the end, when Arrakis is restored, Fremen culture is completely transformed. It disappears. They're no longer mm -hmm. the great warriors they they once were because um, they they have achieved their dream and actually destroyed themselves. Mm -hmm. So that is also a uh, oh, that's a great a, tension. Uh, <laughs> a tension to explore. Yeah. Um, I, I have a note here to myself. You know, again. The, the land was blasted by chaos. Chaos was was defeated, uh, but not thrown out by Stormbull. Stormbull is still important on the Plains of Prax because mm -hmm. there is chaos still everywhere. When in doubt, kill chaos. Yeah, there, it's, it's a great focus for a campaign. <laughs> now, here's the thing. You can play as Praxian nomads, even if your GM is setting it in Dragon Pass. So why would you yes. want to play someone from Prax? Uh, number one, sweet writing animal. Uh, I think the bisons in my party killed more people than the people in my party. Uh, bolo lizards are amazing. You get to ride something. If, you, if you're somebody who likes animal companions or wants a unique mount, be from Prax. But also, 
you get to have that sort of Conan experience playing a Praxian nomad in a, a Dragon Pass campaign. You are the barbarian. You are the outsider. You are the the elite warrior of your tribe who, for whatever reason, through exile or as a mercenary or just because your family intermarried with someone from, uh, you know, Atula at the edge of Prax, you are now in the lands of civility and civilization and you are the outsider looking in. You're almost the point of view um, of what's really wrong with this as conan always comments on the decadent nature of cities and civilization that could be you as a praxian nomad evan anything you want to add to that before we go into uh, we're i think we've we've got a tight we did a tight uh episode here tight tight yeah. uh, tight um like a bolo lizard <laughs> i mean it it also gives you a great fish out of water mm -hmm. sort of uh, uh, experience, you know, uh, if you if you want to go that way again, you know, in a land coming from a land where the horse is taboo, and then going to a land where the horse becomes common, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I <laughs> I I had a Praxian nomad in an old RQ2 game. They went to Balazar. He was a rhino rider, and uh, a, a a zombie killed his rhino, and for two years of gameplay he walked because acceptable you know that there was there were no it was very hard to get a rhino in balazar he he did eventually get a new rhino but so again you know the the the, the limitations of your culture like mm -hmm. you will only ride so yes the other animals are not taboo but they're not your animals either right. so if you're a rhino rider you're not going to ride a bison or a zebra or anything else that would be shameful. Mm -hmm. That would be humiliating. You certainly won't ride a horse. Right. You won't even uh. eat a horse. Um, so um, again, the sort of fish out of water to the tension. Uh, I think that that uh, also uh, has a lot of rich and enjoyable play uh, play to it. Sometimes it can be played for humor. Sometimes for great drama. Um, sometimes for great you know self sacrifice. Like, mm -hmm. look, I won't give up my culture. It, it, it is what has kept me and my people alive for centuries. Uh, Praxians are deeply conservative because only a few things work on the plains of Prax mm -hmm. or you're dead. So right. it's very interesting. So if you're looking for more resources to get into Prax, if what we've done has sort of excited you and you want to go play or run a game in Prax, first of all, check out the God Learners podcast. Ludo and the crew had a great interview, series of series of interviews, right, with David Scott about Nomad Gods, Prax, and, and all of this. Go check them out. Uh, we got to hang out with Ludo at Chaosium Con, which was a, a wonderful uh, time and experience. Uh, the first place to go is get your RuneQuest Glorantha book out. There is a ton of information on, the, on Prax, just in the main in the main book if you want to look at the sartar or the gloranthan source book or the guide to glorantha there is a ton of information you can go as deep as you want in prax but there's also we covered some of the rune quest classic and the quest world supplements hopefully we'll see new versions of the quest world supplements come out which just means i'll have to buy them again because they'll probably be in full color and hardback and you know i'm a sucker for that evan but there are some great Johnstown Compendium support. And I'm going to turn this over to Evan because uh, the only ones I've read are uh, Sandheart. So, oh, there's also, before we stop, go over on the Chaosium channel, Jeff Richards' home campaign that he's, he's posting up on YouTube. White Bull focuses on Pavis, but sort of spirals out into Prax every now and then. All right, Evan, I'm going to turn this over to you. Tell us about Johnstown Compendium. Great. Yeah, so um, I, I would call out uh, uh, four uh, areas of, of supplements. Uh, the first is uh, from the Beer with Teeth crew. They have a series of linked adventures. They, they're standalone, but uh, you can string them together into a kind of campaign. Uh, the first was Stone and Bone deals with scorpion men in Prax. And so, you know, it's the kill chaos kind of thing, but I'm, I'm you know, with a twist. Uh, Gifts of Prax is uh, uh, another, you know, sort of spiritual shamanic 
uh, adventure, and then the Life Thief, even you know, even more of that. Um, uh, so, um, and those are great products. The the folks um, that have uh, created those for Johnstown Companion um, uh, really have put terrific art mm -hmm. and uh, terrific imagination into them. Sandheart. So Sandheart, uh, we'll talk. I think even more of we've we've brought it up uh, a number of times. But there are four uh, supplements. Uh, they have to do with the Sun County uh, militia. Um, and so they happen in civilized tracks in the River of Cradles Valley, Zolafell, uh, related to uh, Sundome County. Um, but they, you know, they're not hermetically sealed off. Prax and the Praxians mm -hmm. play a, a an exceptionally important uh, uh, role in those. So there's the uh, uh, there's Sandheart itself, the Corn Dolls tradition, and then the Godskin and Mad Prax, which I think used to be, you know, when, when it was run at conventions, was Mad Prax beyond Sundome. Uh, so, uh, you know, <laughs> love it. Very good stuff. Um, so, most of um, Nick Brooks' uh, 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 mini campaign, Black Spear, although it starts in Sartar, takes place in prax so it is a way for you know your sartar focused uh uh characters to get sent on a very important mission into prax and pavis and sun county you know hitting all the hits um and then more focus towards next week we'll probably mention it again or not next week but next, next month. month um uh there are a couple of um uh, of uh, great source packs uh, for setting in the in the big rubble, but again, that is in the Praxian context. You can't talk about the big rubble without Prax. Um, and uh, these are the rubble redux uh, uh, items. Uh, one is called the Insula of the Rising Sun. The other is the Insula of the Waning Moon. It's a series of maps and things for exploring the ruins of the big rubble, but also come with some adventures and that have you in and out of the the big rubble doing things uh and uh, you could be praxians doing that you could be interacting mm -hmm. with praxians again all uh really rich uh uh things to tap reasonably priced and uh, a lot of uh, great uh, creative uh, effort has gone into all these products so that brings us to the end of our overview of prax we will be back next month with a look at Pavis and Big Rubble. If you don't know what those terms mean, tune in in a month. Now, just normally tomorrow night would be our iconic podcast night, but we're actually pushing it off a week. We're going to have Rob uh, himself, the 13th Age, uh, one of the 13th Age designers himself, on the show next Sunday at 8 Central. We're going to be talking about 13th Age Second Edition. So, Thank you to my co-host, Evan, who uh, puts together just these wonderful outlines. I just enjoy reading through them. It is, it is always difficult to see what gets sacrificed on the floor of our time constraint. But Evan, thank you so much for all the work you do. This is, you're the reason why I enjoy, well, first of all, we'd, I would enjoy doing this show if no one was watching because you and I just love talking about Glorant. Yep. We, we fooled people into thinking that it was a show. That's right. But, uh, <laughs> it's not. It's it's like uh, not two of my favorite authors, uh, Stephen Erickson and Ian Esselmont. They fooled everyone into thinking it was a fantasy series when it was just a bunch of role playing game fan fiction that they were sending back and forth to each other, and then made a ton of money off. It. So until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay gaming. I am JM, the the talker. This is Evan. <laughs> The scribe. Evan, thank you so much. It is always a good time chatting Gloranta with you. Likewise. So Thanks until so next month. Me. Oh, sorry to interrupt you. No, no. Oh, until next month, we no, will. Just... <laughs> I'm saying nothing. Go, Evan. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just happy to be here. Uh, Let's see you next month. I am as well. With that, we will see you all in a month. Have a good one. Bye, everybody.